Today I've been asked to speak about on the subject um, of a theme, God is Love. Um, some people may ask whether this is relevant to Bhagavan's teachings. Is it, is it necessary to consider such a subject in the context of Bhagavan's teachings? Is it necessary even to believe in God? Um, well, it is not necessary to believe in God because all we need to do is we need to investigate ourselves and find out what we actually are. But the concept of God is potentially a useful concept and Bowen has often referred to it. And most people who come to the spiritual path come from some sort of a religious background or some sort of, have, have some sort of an idea about God, some sort of belief in God. Um, uh, so it, that, that uh, concept of God is used by Bhagavan and in uh, Advaita philosophy more, um, more generally as an aid to turn our attention back within. Um, so when we consider this question, God is love, the first thing we have to ask is what is meant by the term God? Generally, we all have, I mean, the, the idea of God is originated from the fact that as finite human beings, we feel relatively powerless. Our power is very limited. We feel there's some greater power that is moving events. And so it is quite natural for people to believe in that higher power, and it's called God. And in different cultures, they have different uh, beliefs about gods. Um, some cultures have ideas about many gods, but even those cultures that believe in many gods tend to have an idea of some ultimate power beyond all these. That ultimate power is what, we, what is called God with a capital G. Um, but people have different ideas. People think of God as an old man with a grey beard up in the clouds, or someone who's in far away in heaven, or um, they give different names, uh, uh, Vishnu, Shiva, Jesus, Buddha, uh, whatever, yeah, Allah, whatever. People have so many different ideas about God. I mean, they, first of all, there are many different names that people use to refer to God, and they attach many concepts to those names. Um, <coughs> But what Advaita teaches us, and what Bhagavan teaches us, is that what God, ultimately what God is, is our own self. God is, we, but actually, God actually is the one infinite whole. And since nothing can be other than the infinite whole, we must all be, um, must all be that. Some people say, oh, are we part of that? If we are something small, we can be a part. But actually, in our essence, we're not even a part of God. We are God himself. Um, in Upadesha Undia, um, verse uh, 24, I think, Bhagavan says, Irukum ekayal isa jiva gal oruparul le ava undipara upadi unavei ver undipara that means, uh, in their being nature, God and souls are one substance. Only their upadionavu, upadionavu means their awareness of adjuncts, or their sense of adjuncts, is different. Um, what that means, what he means by awareness of adjuncts, what we essentially are, as he said in the, in the previous verse, he said, um, uh, Unudu uh, onara to know that which is. Um, is there any? Is uh, is there? Oh, since there is no awareness other than that which is, to know that which is, that which is is awareness. That which is the term he used in Tamil is uludu. That simply means what is, what actually exists. So what actually exists is awareness. I mean, in the last uh, line of that verse, he says. Uh, uh, Unave uh, namai ulam. That means uh, uh, awareness exists as a, as we, as ourself. So we, what we essentially are, is just awareness. So what he refers to in the, the first, in in the next verse, as irakumi 
the, the being nature is awareness. So in our essential awareness, we are no different from God. Our real substance and the real substance of God is only awareness. But we are not aware of ourselves only as awareness. We are now aware of ourselves as a person. As a person, we have a body, we have a mind, we were born and we're going to die. And so many um, uh, attributes, so many uh, things we attribute to ourselves because we take ourselves to be this body. So all these things that we attribute to ourselves, they're upadis, they're uh, adjuncts, things that we've added to ourselves and we take to be ourselves. So what divides us from God is these adjuncts. And just like we, because we've limited ourselves with these, this set of adjuncts, we cannot, we say God is infinite, but we can't actually uh, form a mental concept of the infinite. We, e even the term infinite is a negative term. It means it's not finite, it's not limited. Except in negative terms, we can't actually conceive what that, that is. Because the finite can only know what is finite, uh, and only the infinite can know what is infinite. So uh, we, we cannot adequately conceive um, what that infinite whole is, so we, we, uh, we form a certain concept about God. All the ideas we have about God, that is his adjuncts. But our adjuncts and the adjuncts that we attribute to God all exist only in our view, not in the view of God because God is just that pure awareness. Uh, <clears throat> what, what is aware of anything other than itself is not pure awareness, but only this mixed awareness, I am this body, the ego. Uh, when we exist as pure awareness, we cannot know anything other than pure awareness. Because as Bhagavan says in verse 4 of Uludunapadu, if oneself is a form, the world and God will be likewise. If one is not a form, who can see their forms and how? Uh, and then in the next sentence he says, can allow Pakshi on do. That means, can, uh, can, uh, uh, can what is seen be other than the eye? The eye then doesn't mean, I, the pronoun eye, it means eye as in the, the organ of sight. Um, but it, it's used, the word eye is used there as a metaphor for awareness. So if the awareness is aware of itself as a form, it will see forms. If the awareness is aware of itself as finite, it will see what is finite. If the awareness is aware of itself not as a form or not as finite, it, it will only see what is infinite. In other words, it will see only itself. So all these adjuncts that we are aware of, both our own adjuncts and the adjuncts that we attribute to God, all exist in our view. So we have a limited view of God because we've, we've limited ourselves, we cannot but have a limited view of God. And because our view of God is limited, God seems to be something other than ourselves, and we seem to be something other. Only when we know what we ourselves actually are, will we be able to experience God as ourself. Now we have an idea, we learn from uh, uh, Upanishads. Um, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. Brahman is a term that um, means God in the most abstract or metaphys metaphysical sense. Um, you know, the infinite whole. I am Brahman. You are that. You, you yourself are Brahman or God. Um, uh, um, I, I am Atman uh, um, um, uh, Brahman. This self is Brahman. And Pragnanam Brahman. Pure awareness is Brahman. So from all these we understand what we really are is Brahman. But though we had this idea now, because we've read, we read about this in books, we still experience ourselves as this body. We still experience ourselves as a person. So we're not now experiencing ourselves as Brahman. Until we experience what we really are, which is Brahman, we cannot, uh, we, th th that separation between ourselves and God will seem to be there. And so uh, because we conceive of God as something infinitely greater than us, but still something other than ourselves. Uh, that's how the path of bhakti comes into, into being. We want, to, we want to return to God. We want to merge back into God. And so we pray to God, we worship God, all the, the whole path of bhakti comes. That is, um, 
that is useful so long as our mind is turned outwards. And let's face it, even after reading Bhagavad teachings, even after learning, but what we should be doing is turning back within, turning to face ourselves. Most of the time, our attention is turned outwards. Most of the time, we're aware of things other than ourselves. Because this is the very nature of the ego. But the ego rises, as Bhagavan says in verse 25 of Uludanapati, rises by grasping form, stands by grasping form. Uh, grasping and feeding on form, it flourishes. Leaving one form, it grasps another form. What he means by, there by form is any phenomena. And the first phenomena we're aware of, the first phenomena we grasp, is the body that we now take to be ourself. So um, the very nature of ego, ego rises by facing outwards, facing away from itself. That's why he says in the same verse, Tedinal autum pidicum, if sought, it takes flight. That's if the ego, whose nature is to be aware of things other than itself, to rise and grasp in its awareness of other things, if it tries to turn back towards itself to see what it itself is, it will disappear. The ego seems to exist only so long as we're looking away from ourselves. Um, so, because we are still... Um, the ego is born of attachment, it's born by grasping form. So, generally the ego has very strong desires and attachments. It's, so it's constantly trying to face outwards for its own survival. Um, so, uh, because most of the time our attention is turned outwards, the concept of God can be a useful concept. When we, when, we, when we are trying to turn within and trying and trying and finding we're constantly failing, sometimes we become dispirited. The concept of God is, uh, can then help us. We can turn to God in prayer. As Bhagavan has, has taught us the path of prayer in Arunachya Stuti Panchakam, particularly in Akshram, like 108 verses, how we should pr pray. We, it's, um, we shouldn't be praying for anything external, anything outside ourselves, because what is we are to experience in our outward life, what is to happen, will happen, whatever effort we make to prevent it, and what is not to happen will not happen, how much effort we make to achieve it, as Bhagavan said in the note he wrote for his mother. So we cannot change anything outwardly, so praying for outward things is I wouldn't say useless, but it's not going to change things if we pray for outward things. If we pray, if a, a dear friend or relative is sick, we may pray for their recovery or something. That's not going to actually change anything. But it makes us feel better sometimes when we, when we pray. But we do, even, even atheists, in effect, pray. Because we all wish for something. And, wishing is, and that's what prayer is about, we're wishing for something. Um, and... If our prayer is directed towards God, to that extent, it is, and if, it's, if we're praying selflessly, without, I mean, if we're praying for, for wealth and other things, that's not going to purify our mind. Because we, we, then God is just a means to our end. We, we're not really in love with God, we're in love with what we can get from God. But if we are praying selflessly, um, to, that ex to the extent that our prayer or our worship of God is selfless, to that extent it will purify our mind. And a purified mind is necessary to turn within. So we can't say prayer is useless, because it can potentially purify the mind. But the, what is the useful thing to pray about is to pray for the annihilation of our own ego. Why is that prayer useful? Because in order for the ego to be annihilated, it must be willing to sacrifice itself. It must be willing to surrender to God. It must be willing to surrender to Bhagavan. Bhagavan is never going to come and kill our ego until we are ready to offer it to him. He will never force um, the annihilation of the ego on us. Only when we are ready, when we have love to merge back, in, complete, absolute, all-consuming love to merge back in him, will our ego be annihilated. Um, so praying for the annihilation of the ego is basically channeling our love towards that. Um, so prayer as taught by Bowen and Akshram Rai is useful. And the concept of a God outside to whom we can pray is useful. But Bowen reminds us in the very first verse of Akshram Rai, Arunachala mena ahame nene pava ahateva arupaya Arunachala Oh, Arunachya, you root out the ego 
of those who meditate on you, then the two meaning two means Arunachala Mena Ahame mean um, who think of Arunachala Aham in, in Tamil has two meanings. There's a Tamil word Aham, which means inside or within or in the heart or home. It's also a Sanskrit word which means I. So in Tamil the word Aham has two meanings. It means I and it means what is within. The, the heart, which actually is one and the same, because what is within is only I. Um, so, it, that uh, hame that can mean it, uh, who, uh, within who, who, or in the heart. So, you meditate, you, you root out the egos of those who meditate on you in the heart, or it can mean uh, the, those who are natural mena ahame nenipaba, those who think, but are natural is only I. So Bhagavan gives a clue in the very first verse. Though Arunachala appears outwardly in the form of a hill, what Arunachala actually is, is our own real self. Because Arunachala is God. And God is, is what we actually are. So Arunachala is always shining within us as I. So even when we're praying to Arunachala, we can be directing our prayer back within. That very much helps to turn our attention back within and to help us uh, restore the self-attentiveness that we, we lose as soon as our mind goes outwards. So, um, though it's not essential, we, if, if someone is an atheist, but one will never say, no, you have to believe in God in order to follow this path. But obviously it's not necessary. If people come from an atheist background, but one will say, in some place in Mahash's uh, Gospel, it's recorded, but Bhagavan said, um, someone's saying, oh, I'm very we are very weak and helpless, will not God help us? Something to that effect, I can't remember exactly what it is. And Bhagavan said, if you believe God will do f for you what you, want, what you want him to do, surrender yourself to him. If, uh, if you have doubts about that, leave God alone, know yourself. So we, it's not essential for us to uh, believe in God. If people don't, if people say come from an atheist background, they and come to Bhagavan's path, it's not necessary that we say, oh no, you have to believe in God in order to follow Bhagavan. It's not necessary at all. Um, but if we follow Bhagavan's path, naturally we'll understand, we'll, we'll develop an understanding of that concept and the role that that concept has to play in our spiritual practice, in our following the spiritual path. So what God essentially is, is our own self. But what he seems to be is something other than ourselves, because he is infinite, we are finite, if there seems to be a separation. But actually, nothing can be other than the infinite, so we cannot actually be other than God. Um, so, in, in the path of devotion, the path of devotion always starts with the concept of God as another. So we worship God either by physically, by, doing, by, by body, by doing puja, outward worship, or we do inward prayers or japa or singing stotras or something, we, we do that by speech. And by mind we do meditation. But we, even when meditating, we're still meditating on God as something other than ourselves, initially. Then, as Bhagavan says in verse 8 of Upadesh Undia, Anya Bhavatin Avanahamahum Ananya Bhava Mayundipara Anetinum Uttamamundipara Anya Bhava means um, meditating on God, oh, where God isn't there. Anya means what is other. So Anya Baba means uh, uh, meditation on what is other or um, the attitude of, uh, of otherness. More than that, but the implication there is meditating on God as other than ourself. Uh, um, rather than that, Avana uh, Hamahum Ananya Baba. Ananya Baba means Ananya means what is not other. So it means meditation on what is not other. What is not other than ourself? Only ourself is not other than ourself. So the implication of Ananya Baba is self-attentiveness, meditating on oneself. That is Atma Vichara. And uh, he, adds, uh, he gives a relative clause there to describe that Ananya Baba. He says, Avanaha Mahom, that the Ananya Baba in which he is I. So, if we believe that God is I, what, how do we meditate on God? Do we sit there and say, I am God, I am God, or he, he is I, he is I? No, that's not the way, because 
our attention is then not, not on I. Our attention is, is oscillating between that concept of he and I. It's oscillating back and forth. If we are really convinced that God is I, then we should meditate only on I. Because God is I. So by meditating on I, we're meditating on God. So what Bhagavan implies by Ananya Baba is Atma Vichara, basically, attending to ourself, investigating ourself. That is, and he says in the last line, anatinum utamam. That is the best among all, the best of all. That means it's the best of all forms of bhakti, it's the best of all forms of meditation, it's the best of all forms of spiritual practice. So ultimately we have to come to this path of Atma Vichara, because this alone is the direct path that will lead us back to our source, lead us back to what we actually are, which is Brahman, that one infinite whole, or God. Um, so, according to Bhagavan, what, though, though Bhagavan, there's room in Bhagavan's teaching for the idea of God as something other than ourselves, so long as our mind is turned outwards, because when our mind turns outwards, he seems to be something other than ourselves. But the fundamental principle of Bhagavan's teaching is God exists within us as ourself, as he, as he stresses in later verses of Upadeshundiya. Um, because in, I, told, I quote first uh, verse 24 of Upadeshundiya, I think it's 24, um, Ira keal isa jivagal oruparulayaba unipara unpadi unavebera unipara, that is um, <coughs> In their, in their uh, irukumiyake, in their being nature, in their nature of, of be, uh, being, God and souls are one substance, only their uh, sense of upadi, their upadi unavu, is different. Um, or of adjuncts, that is. Um, in the next verse, he says, the logical conclusion of that, um, <coughs> um, uh, seeing oneself without adjuncts, um, Tanayu padi vittu tan ordele. I can't remember that word in Tamil. Um, seeing oneself or knowing oneself without adjuncts is knowing God, because God shines in as oneself. Um, <coughs> um, so the basic principle of, God, of Bhagavan's teaching is that God is always shining in us as our own self, as I. So if we want to meditate on God, the best way to meditate on God is meditating on, only on I. So now I, I think I've answered in the context of Bhagavan's teaching what is meant by the word God. Now this um, idea of God is love. This idea comes in, I think it probably an idea that occurs in most religions. It's definitely there in Hinduism, it's, um, definitely, it's there in Christianity, I think in, in the Bible or somewhere Christ says God is love. Um, I can't remember very clearly and I imagine it's there probably in most other theistic religions, religions that have, are based on a concept of God. Um, so when it is said God is love, what actually does this mean? Does it mean does it mean that God alone is love? There's no love other than God? Or does it mean many things are love? One of those things that is love is God. Well, if God is the love or infinite whole, there cannot, and if he is love, there cannot be any love other than God. So all the manifestations of love that we see in this world, we all have feelings of love. We love our family, we love our friends, we love, we even love material objects that we think give us pleasure. That, fe that feeling of love in us is not God in the pure form, but it is a, it is a, it is a, a limited expression of the love that exists within us. So, uh, um, so there's actually no such thing as love other than God, but there are impure forms of, God, of love, which obviously are not God in his pure form. So why is it said that God is love? Well, as Bhagavan taught us, God is what we actually are. God is our own self. And one thing we, we all experience, we all experience love for ourselves. It is the very nature of awareness to love itself. So when we, when we rise as this ego, as this mixed awareness, 
I am this body, we have love for this body. We, how much care we take of this body, we feed it, we clothe it, we have it, get a nice bed for it to sleep on, we protect it from the elements. We take so much care of this uh, body throughout our life. Bhagavan, uh, it, as a, just as an aside, this is not to, uh, relevant to the main topic, when Bhagavan was asked whether idol worship is correct, he said, who is there who is not engaging in idol worship? What do they do in the temple when they worship an idol? They take that, that image or uh, linga or the image or whatever type of image it is, they take that to be God. And just as if uh, um, uh, a much loved and respected guest came to your house, you would feed them, you would give them a nice bed to sleep in, you would offer them, if they come tired with, um, from a journey, you'll offer them nice fresh clothes to wear, um, and you'll offer them uh, to have a bath and everything. So this is basically what you're, is going on in temple. You bathe the idol, um, you give it nice fresh clothes, you adorn it with flowers, and you offer food to it. So it's basically what, what we would do with a guest, we, we, we are doing with that idol. But Bhagavan said, this is what we, all of us, are, if there's no one in this world who is not an idol worshipper. Because we're all worshipping this idol, our body. Which uh, we, 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 feed, we bathe it, we dress it in nice clothes, we um, give it a nice bed to sleep at night, we feed it with nice food, we take so much care of this. Um, so we, we all have love for ourselves. It's the very nature of every living being is having love for, it, 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 having love for itself. Even if, even, there are some people who commit suicide. People could say, oh, that's, an act of, that's not an act of self-love. Even that is an act of self-love because, because people are tormented by mental problems or whatever it is, they feel that if they can get rid of this body, they'll be free of these problems. So it is for their love for themselves that they kill the body. So even suicide is an act of self-love. So there is nothing that we don't do that is not motivated by love for ourselves. Even if we do very, what, seemingly very selfless things, if we make, even if we make sacrifices for other people, why are we doing it? Ultimately we're doing it because for our own satisfaction. There's a famous story of Abraham Lincoln, or one of the um, uh, early American presidents, but one day he was walking down the road and he saw a pig stuck in the mud. And he got into the mud to help the pig out. And when someone asked him, why are you the president of such a great country, getting in the mud to help a mere pig? He said, I didn't do it for the pig, I did it for myself. Because I couldn't bear to see the pig st struggling in that mud. I had to get in there to help it. So we are all ultimately, even the most selfless acts, are done, are motivated by self-love. Because self-love is our real nature. Now our self-love is directed to this body because we mistake this body to be ourself. But in our real nature, but in the very nature of uh, oh, our real nature is Brahman, to give it a name. As Brahman, Brahman has infinite love for itself. And because Brahman, Brahman is what we actually are, because Brahman has infinite love for itself, and because Brahman is infinite, there's nothing other than it, so it loves everything as itself. So now we are seemingly separated from Brahman by rising as this ego, by feeling I am this person, I am Michael, I have separated... Not, I haven't actually separated myself from Brahman, I can never do that. But I seem to have separated myself from Brahman. I seem to be something other than Brahman. I don't seem now to be the infinite whole, infinite pure awareness. I now seem to be a little finite person who born some 60 odd years ago and is going to die a few years hence. I, I'm limited in time, I'm limited in space, in this vast universe. I'm just occupying this small space. So, Obviously, I feel very, very different to Brahman. So, um, um, so I've limited myself, and so my, my self-love is now directed to this limited form. But in our real nature, we have infinite love. And since there's nothing other than ourselves, that infinite love is only for ourselves. 
So this idea God is love, what does it actually mean? It means God is that infinite whole. As the infinite whole, he has infinite love for himself. And because in his view, nothing is other than himself, he loves us all as himself. It is said in, in the Bible somewhere, it is said, love thy neighbor as thyself. How is it possible to love our neighbor as ourself so long as we see our neighbor as other than ourself? So long as we, uh, however much we may love another person, our love for that other person is less than our love for ourselves. So we cannot love our, an, our neighbor as ourself until we see our neighbor as ourself, until we actually experience our neighbor as ourself. And we cannot experience our neighbor as ourself so long as we limit ourselves as this body. So, it's only by knowing what we actually are that we can love our neighbour as ourself. So, but God doesn't see anything other than himself. So he loves us all as himself. Um, and this, the, the concept of God, of grace, this is what grace actually is. People have different ideas about grace, but all grace is actu actually is, is the infinite love that God has for himself. And because he has infinite love for himself, he has love for us. He has love, and what God loves is to be himself. So since he doesn't see us as other than himself, he loves us to be himself. So the, the power of grace is always drawing us back to return to our source. The power of Maya draws our mind outwards. But Maya is, even Maya is not other than grace. But it's the, it's the antithesis of grace in a way. It's the, the negative reflection of grace. Because as soon as the mind rises, we see multiplicity, we see uh, good and bad, we see long, short, uh, knowledge, ignorance, all these uh, love, hatred, we see all these uh, dualities uh, come into existence as soon as we rise as the ego. Um, <coughs> um, so, uh, sorry, I've forgotten exactly how I came to that point. Um, so, uh, so uh, yes, God, God, God loves us as, as to, just to be ourselves. So that power is all, oh I know, I was saying about Maya, that's why. Uh, yes, it, it, the, the power of Maya draws our mind outwards, the power of grace is what draws our mind back within. Um, the power of maya is the power of desire, the power to, uh, of love for things other than ourselves, that is desire. But love for ourselves is the pure form of love. So that power that draws us back within, that is grace or the love of God. So um, uh, because God sees us as himself and because God loves us to be himself, that power of grace is always working to draw our mind within. But we are constantly resisting that power of God's love. God's love wants us to turn within. We want to turn without, outwards. So Bhagavan said, the, um, God's grace is never lacking. God's grace is always available. So people complain, oh, God isn't kind to me. God isn't gracious to me. That is a that is a, a unjustified accusation. The accusation of not being gracious belongs only to the jiva, belongs only to us. We, God is gracious to us because he's always shining in us as I. He's our nearest and dearest. We are ungracious to him because we don't attend to him. We look at other things. So it's we who, it's our, our grace that is lacking, not God's grace. So if we want to enjoy God's grace in full, we have to apply our grace by turning our attention back within, uh, diverting our, our love, which we now feel for other things, back towards ourselves, devoting all our love, all our attention back to ourselves. That is the true path of bhakti, turning within. And if we... And all this will be known simply by persistent practice, as he, Bhagavan says in, um, in verse 20, uh, 40, uh, 44, I think, of, uh, of Aksharam Lai, Tirumbiya Hamdene Dina Maha Kankan Teriyamundrene and Arunachala. That is, um, uh, turning back within, daily see yourself with the inner eye. Uh, Teriyam, it will be known. 
uh, Indrani and Arunachala, you taught me this, what a wonder. So this is what, this is what Arunachala taught Bhagavan, this is what Bhagavan taught us. Uh, it's the nature of the ego to be turning outwards, to be uh, dragged outwards by its desires and attachments. Uh, we, we cannot all of a sudden uh, prevent that and uh, turn back within. Slowly, slowly we have, to, we have to practice turning our attention back within. And the more we resist the outward going um, uh, tendency of the ego, that is the Vashaya Vasana, the, the, the uh, inclination to be aware of things other than itself, the more we resist that and cultivate this love to know ourselves by persistent practice of self-attentiveness, the more our mind will be purified, the more our love for just to be, as we really are, will increase. So this persistent daily practice is necessary. But, but what is the force, what is the driving force behind this? It's only love. It's love for other things that draws our mind outwards. We now have to redirect our love back within. Then only we will see that what we actually are is love, which is the real nature of God. And Bhagavan expresses this very beautifully in, I think it's verse 101 of Aksham Malai. Ambu villali pol, amburu vanileni, anbai kari tadalar natchala. Ambu villali pol means like ice in water. Melt me as love in you, the form of love, our natchala. So Bhagavan is saying our natchala is the form of love. And we are like ice in water. We are also the same water, but our love is, uh, is frozen cold and frozen because of our, all our desires for things other than ourselves. That frozen love has to melt and merge back into the ocean of love, but it, which is our natural love. In another verse, in the uh, second verse of, Pancha, of our natural patikam, Bhagavan says, Ambu, uh, sorry, uh, Amburu varunachala, that is our natural love, a form of love. So that is what God really is, is pure love. And we are not other than that. But we have allowed that love to become frozen into this limited form that we now take to be ourself. And we have so much love for this limited form and for all the things that uh, seem to contribute to our happiness as this limited person that we now seem to be. That by one compares to ice. And that ice has to melt back into the ocean of love. Which is, what is that love, that love? Sat, chit, ananda. Sat is what is, uladu, what we actually are. Uh, chit is unavu, awareness. And ananda is happiness. What, we, we love what makes us happy. And what, when we achieve what we love, it, it, uh, it, that makes us happy. So, love and happiness are, just, are inseparable. That's why um, Satchitananda is sometimes called Asti Bhati Priyam. Asti means being, Bhati means shining, in other words, awareness. Uh, priyam means love. So, uh, the, the, what, what, what real love is, is nothing but the pure self-awareness that we actually are. So if we want to follow the path of love, if we want to follow the path of bhakti, if we want to experience God as love, we have to cultivate the love to be aware of ourself alone, to turn our attention back within, persistently trying, 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 until one day this, uh, this ice-like heart that we have will finally melt back into love, as in, in love as love. So, it, it, basically, it's saying the same thing as, as whether, whether we talk in terms of bhakti or we talk in terms of jnana, the actual practice is one and the same, constantly turning our mind back within. It's just expressing the same thing in different terms. But it's not just for the sake of expressing it in different terms that we express it in different terms, because we all, uh, love is something that is dear to all of us. We all experience love. We all feel love for something or other. So this, the, that love uh, is our very nature. So uh, 
by turning back within, we, 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 we can learn what pure love is only by knowing ourselves. So, it, what it, we, though we can view Bhagavan's teaching from so many different angles, they all point back to ourselves. So all we have to do is to cultivate the love to be persistently self-attentive. Because what our real nature is pure self-awareness. So the more we are self-attentive, the closer we are to being as we actually are. So being, awareness, happiness, love, they're all inseparable. And that is what we actually are. Did I adequately cover the topic? Yes, very. <laughs> very. Bhagavan's teachings are constantly pointing us back within. Whereas a lot of um, religious and spiritual ideas are, are, are drawing our mind outwards. Bhagavan is constantly pointing us back within. So even concepts that would potentially draw our mind outwards, like concepts of God, but one uses those concepts to turn our mind back within. Michael, I was very interested in what you said about even suicide being a form of self-love. Yes. <laughs> well, in the way that you put it, it is. I mean, this, I don't think there can be any doubt about it. Yes. I just wondered, um, in Jainism, um, you can commit suicide in a ritualized way. Yes. When Jains get to a certain point, they can decide that they, they want to die. Yes. And they starve themselves. Or yes. Just mainly, and at the end, all their friends gather around them and are sort of there with them, with the person who is doing it, to yes. share the experience, yes. which is totally loving. Yes, yes. I, I wonder what Bhagavan might have made of that. Well, Bhagavan said, uh, the culprit is not the body. When we commit suicide, we are, we are killing, the, the body is dying. Whether we do it in a, whether we take an overdose of drugs, or we jump off a tall building, or we do it in a loving way, as in Jainism, is the body we are killing. That is not the problem. The body is innocent. If someone has, if, if you've done something to hurt me, I should come and beat you up. I shouldn't, if I start beating your chair, it's not going to do anything to you. So Bowen said, punishing the body is like punishing the chair on which the criminal is sitting. But of course the Jane is not, she's not, he or she is not punishing the But they're still, they're still, okay, they're separating themselves from the body. But that's not the way to separate ourselves from the body. Because we separate ourselves from the body every night when we fall asleep. One day we're all going to die, we're separate from the body. But there, there's no use in that, because the body is not the root of the problem. Because when one body dies, when, when one dream comes to an end, we begin another dream. Yeah. So a, a dream, whatever body we take to be ourselves is just a mental projection. But who is it who projects this body and says this body is I? That is the ego. That is who we have to kill. So it's not, it's not body side that we need, it's ego side that we need. That is the act of pure self-love. <clears throat> Can I just interrupt something on Amsterdam? Uh, for the Germans, it's not, this is, everyone has to say it because it might be misrepresenting the idea of some power which they have said it now. Can you speak up? So, yeah, um, in the case of the Jains, so just so that we don't misrepresent them, it's not a question of committing suicide or uh, you know what's called santara salikna, what they call it. Right. It's not just at any point in time. This is when you're very old and dying, when you're very, very ill. Only at that point, if you're committed to it and you're already a fairly advanced practitioner or a monk or not, at that point in time, it is a way of letting go when you are already well along the way of dying. And the idea there is that you must have monks and nuns with you who will tell you that you're not the body, that you are the self, 
and that you are this kind of consciousness which is pure, and all sorts of uh, stories will be told and so on to help you address it. And the idea is to have full meditative control in the process of dying, to be aware and to be fearless. So it is a spiritual practice, and it's not just sort of cutting off the body. I'm glad you said that. Yeah, it's very important because that, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, one gets I, I, I read an account of this by William Dalrymple, and yeah, yeah. that's not what he says at all. Yeah, well, William Dalrymple is not. Uh, <laughs> he's not he's a very yeah. good in yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I may say, Jain Munis, Jain, Jain followers of Jainism, do commit suicide by fasting to death. Mm. They stop eating and till they actually die. That is the highest form of uh, sacrifice and uh, Jain saints, uh, Jain uh, monks actually practice this and uh, this considered to be the, heavy, the highest form of Surrender. Surrender. The most, you are most attached to your body. So you are surrendering your body. But, but is, it, is it, as she said, is it when their life is come, anyway coming no. to an end? No, even otherwise. Yeah. Uh, even careful. otherwise. Munis, <laughs> they, they commit suicide. No, no, careful, huh? because uh, I, uh, this is something which I actually sort of have from Jan and I teach it as well a little bit. So uh, it's not quite that simple, that's why I sort of uh, even in the case of Mahavira, um, it was, uh, he did say it as well, uh, you don't do it just like that, and you need to be advanced. It's not just, if somebody does it, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. But that's not the traditional actual practice. It's a kind of a, it's a wrong doing to do it like that, because it's a matter of being spiritually that developed, otherwise you're just committing suicide, and you'll be fearful, and that is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm or for the wrong reasons, because a spiritual yeah. practice means the mind, with the jazz control of the yeah. mind and fortitude and so forth. Mm. It's no different from uh, Bhagavan or anybody else in, in the basic idea. Mm. That, uh, so, yeah. And uh, most of the tradition, like Buddhism and Jainism, you have the same basic, yeah. uh, you know, it's the same basic idea. They don't, uh, they, they, you know, they will never say anything which actually will contradict what we're talking about. You know, I mean, unless there's some very weird yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, this is a bit of a sidetrack. Mahatma and I would say would be very against suicide insofar as trying to avoid one's karma, getting yes. out of one's karma. Yes. Because it just creates further karma, which has eventually to be. Yes, that, that's what I would have thought. Was, mm. And I would have thought that that's what Brother Wayne. Yeah, well, yeah. Because I mean, it's necessary. So long as one has a body, one's involved in karma, and one goes on learning, and you have the opportunity to, to realize yourself within, within <coughs> the body. The body is going to come to an end one day. Let it, we should let it all uh, go on yes. in its own time. What Bhagavan's whole teaching is focusing on just one thing and one thing alone, which is this ego. Yes. All problems arise because of this ego. Trying to solve other problems without solving the problem of ego is, 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 until you get to a root cause of a problem, you're not going to solve it. If you have an illness, if the doctors don't know what the root cause is, they'll treat you. They're only treating the symptoms. They may cure one set of symptoms, it'll pop up in the form of some other set of symptoms. So uh, the, the really good doctor will understand what is the root cause of a disease and he will treat only the root cause. That will solve all the symptoms and all possible symptoms. Bhagavan is such a doctor, he has found what is the root cause of our disease, it is this ego. That is what we should concentrate on, on dealing with. That is what we need to kill. Yes. But how do we kill this ego? If, the, if, if Bhagavan says if there's really an ego, you can kill it. But first see whether there's an ego, and then we can decide how to kill it. Look for it, it disappears, you find there's no such thing. How do we, if we mistake a rope to be a snake, however much we beat it, we're not going to kill it. Yeah. The only way to kill it is to look at it carefully and see that it's just a rope. Then in effect the snake is dead. So also, if we look at ourselves carefully to see what we actually are, we'll see that, that we're that infinite pure self-awareness, but we never were this ego, and in effect that ego is dead. 
but actually it's known but it never existed in the first place and that is what is called manonasa destruction of the mind we can't actually destroy the mind yeah. we have to look at the mind the mind here means the ego we have to look at the ego to see what it actually is when we see what it actually is that is that uh, pragnanam which is brahman when we see that but it's pure and infinite self-awareness then there's no such thing as ego because the ego is nothing but a a wrong awareness of ourself, a mistaken awareness of ourself as something other than what we actually are. So when we're aware of ourselves as we actually are, then there is no ego. Yeah. And there never was actually an ego. Because the e even now, in whose view does the ego seem to exist? Bhagavan doesn't tell us we have an ego. We come to Bhagavan and say, and make complaints. And then Bhagavan says, who has all those complaints? Look and see whether there's any, anyone who... Who is that one who comes with all these complaints? If we follow Bhagavan, we look at ourselves to see what we actually are, then there's no one left to complain about, about anything and nothing to complain about. Mm. Wisdom teaches me that I'm nothing. Yes. Love teaches me I'm everything. Right. <laughs> Love teaches me what? Love teaches me I'm everything. Oh. Wisdom teaches me I'm nothing. As the ego we are nothing. As Brahman we are everything. Well, since nobody else is asking mm. questions, may I ask you another one? Yes. Um, can I just say one thing? Yes. We are everything because we're the only thing. Yes. Everything doesn't mean many things. The o we are the only thing, <laughs> according to Bhagavan. Yatatmai uh, uladu apmasarupa mondre, Bhagavan says in Nanya. Uh, what actually exists is only atmasarupa, the real form of ourself. Yes, sorry. Um, this you mentioned very glancingly the question of prayer in relation to God. I mean, the question mm. of prayer is always bound to come up in connection in relation to God. Um, Bhagavan was against petitioning prayer, asking for prayer. Um, yeah, Bhag Bhagavan, there's lots of petitional prayer in, uh, in Aksharam, right? Well, he did, and he also so, asked. I mean, asking you uh, annihilate my ego, is that not a petition? <laughs> Well, but when I ask for lots of things, well, it's what we, it's not, it's petitional, what is, what, petition means we, we ask, we're asking for something. Why we ask for something? Because we, we desire something. Yes. Desire is just a, is just a, a, a limited form of love. Well, I think that's what he was against, he didn't want. Yeah, he, what he didn't want is, is asking for petitions about the external world, because what is to happen in the external world is going to happen anyway. Yeah. And Bhagavan wasn't even, we can't even say Bhagavan was against it. Bhagavan wasn't against anything. Uh, um, because Bhagavan, you know, everyone is at their own stage of development. At a certain stage, uh, throughout much of our development, um, we are concerned about our family, uh, about external things. We think happiness comes from external things, so we ask for external things. Bhagavan wasn't against that. Bhagavan always tries us to make us go beyond that. So better than, um, than Kamiya Bhakti is Nishkamiya Bhakti. That's better than des uh, desire-based uh, um, Bhakti is desire-free Bhakti. And better than, uh, uh, even among desire-free Bhakti, uh, better than uh, bhakti for God as another, bhakti for God as oneself. So Bhagavan is always, he's not uh, condemning anything, he's always trying to make us go further, make us go beyond. So the, the path of prayer that Bhagavan exemplified in, um, in Aksharam Lai and other hymns in, uh, in, in, in our Natchez to Panchakam is all prayer about turning back within. Bhagavan asks uh, in, in I think verse 7 of our natural Navamani Malai Ennam um, medubo adu sevai kanne yundram 
Karolineo, Karol Peruke Teruwaye, do whatever you want, only give me ever increasing, uh, that is not even ever increasing, the word ever isn't there, give me increasing love for your two feet. So that's a petition, isn't it? He's asking for love. Yes. Well, uh, but what, what, what better thing to ask for, for pure love for, for uh, Bhagavan? And how can our love for Bhagavan be pure? Only when we see Bhagavan as ourself and turn our attention back within. So petition or prayer isn't wrong, we, but we should, we should pray for that which is... Um, that um, which we can change. We cannot change anything in the external world. We cannot change what is destined to happen is going to happen whether we like it or not. We cannot change that one iota. We can add to it an iota. We cannot subtract from it an iota. What we can do, Bhagavan said, prarabdha affects the outward facing mind, not, not the inward facing mind. So prarabdha can never prevent us from turning our attention within. When we turn our attention outwards, we have to experience prarabdha. But even while experiencing prarabdha, we can turn our attention back within and thereby, Bhagavan said, nindrida sendrida nire uh, uh, let it go, go on or let it stop. Uh, it's not other than you. Uh, you were asking me about that, the last line of verse 6 of uh, Arnacha Ashtakam. Yes. Let it go on or let it stop. It's not other than you. That means let all this parab, all this uh, thoughts, all the, let it all go on. It's not other than you. If we turn our attention within, we don't have to be concerned about parabda at all. We don't have to worry about whether it's fate or free will or whatever it is. But Bhagavan often said, the only proper use of free will, you can if you want use your free will to try and change parabda. You can try as much as you like, but you're not going to change anything. Therefore, the only proper use of free will is to turn within. So, and we are always free to turn within. So that, that freedom, so because we are free to turn within, praying for turning within, praying for the love to turn within, that is meaningful. But praying for cha any changes in the external world, any changes in our life. It, I mean, at least when we're doing that, our attention is turned towards God. So to that extent, it may be pur purifying our mind. Because we're thinking of that which is infinitely pure, even though our, con our understanding of it may not be pure. To that extent, it may be beneficial praying for external things. But uh, the, the, the most beneficial prayer, but what we should be praying for, is that love to turn back within. That's a pretty good answer. Thank mm. you. Uh, turning within. Yes. Um, uh, I presume you mean self inquiry. Yes. Uh, I found the child. Yes. Um, can you explain the method? Okay, but just before that, I'll just say one thing about... Um, according to Bhagavan, what is within is only I. So, people think that if they're, if they're sitting with eyes uh, closed, uh, meditating on some idea or something, they're, they're facing within. According to Bhagavan, that's all facing outwards. Being aware of anything other than ourself is facing outwards. What he calls ahamukam, facing inwards or facing to I, it's facing only towards I and towards nothing else. So, yes, as you say, uh, turning within is, um, is self-inquiry, self-investigation. We investigate what we ourselves actually are. How can we investigate what we actually are? Only by looking at ourselves, metaphorically speaking. Uh, so, it's by, uh, by turning our attention back within to see what we actually are. That is what self-inquiry is. Um, Bhagavan has given us lots of clues about this practice. But when people asked him how to do it, he said, do you need to be shown the way inside your own home? You, every, we are all aware of ourselves. There's no one who is not aware of I. 
I am, uh, <coughs> people say to Bhagavan, Bhagavan, I can't find this eye. Who is that I who can't find the eye? We are all, there, there is never a moment, throughout our waking state we're aware of ourselves. Throughout the dream state we're aware of ourselves. Throughout sleep we're aware of ourselves. But in waking and dream, we are aware of ourselves as something. We're aware of ourselves as this person. That is the, that is the ego, the, 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 um, the mistaken self-awareness. The awareness of ourself is something other than what we actually are. So it's, it's to be aware of ourself as we actually are. So we have to withdraw our attention from other things and focus it on ourself. That's on the awareness. What is it that is aware of all these things? Who is this I who perceives all these things? To whom do all these things appear? It's turning our attention back, trying to see what we ourselves actually are. When we start off, because our, because our minds are habitually outward going, our power of attention is relatively gross. We're able to perceive things that are relatively gross. What we are is something that is infinitely subtle. So our attention has to become very subtle. So it's only by this practice of turning within, practice of trying more and more to be self-attentive, we are refining our power of attention. We, we are making it more and more subtle. In one verse in um, Arunachya um, Ashtagam, Bhagavan says, when the, when the stone called mind is uh, polished on the, on the, on the mind, on, on, on itself. That means when we turn our attention back towards ourselves, we are polishing our mind, we are polishing our power of attention, we are refining our power of attention, until eventually we will be able to see what we actually are. Because now our self-awareness is a mix with awareness of this body, mix, it's mixed with upadis. When we look at it, we are first looking at this adjunct mixed self-awareness. But by trying to to look more and more at what is it that is aware of all these things. We are, we are getting, our, our focus on ourself is getting sharper and sharper. Bhagavan says in, uh, in uh, one answer in, um, and that's recorded in Maharshi's Gospel, the ego is chit jadagranti. In your investigation into the source of the ego, you are, you are investigating the essential chit aspect of the ego. Chit jadagranti means the, the knot uh, that, uh, that is formed by the mixture of chit, which is awareness, and jada, which is anything that is not aware. The body is not aware, the, the thoughts are not aware. We're mixed up with all these things. So this mixture is called chit jadagranti, the knot between the, what is aware and what is non-aware. So between the subject and the object, this mixture, that is Chit Jadagranti, that is the ego. This, this body is actually an object of our perception. But we are mistaking this object to be ourselves, the subject. So there's a, this ego is a mixture of these things. We are trying to separate these things. We can only separate them by isolating the awareness. In, in science, if they, supposing, um, in science, they find some particular um, plant has some medicinal property. It's able to help cure cancer or something. It uh, kills cancer cells or something. What the scientists will do, they will analyze that plant. They will try to extract the ingredient. They'll try to isolate what is the active ingredient in it that is killing those cancer cells. So it's by isolating things. So long as it's the whole plant, they can't make out whether it's the, this compound or that compound or whatever what it is. Only by isolating the compounds and trying each of them individually, they're able to find out what is the active ingredient. Or maybe there are two or three of them, they have to work together to be active. They, they do this all by isolation. In, in, um, a, another thing in science they do, they always... Um, uh, they, 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 because they're trying to test for one particular thing, they have to allow for variation. So they have to isolate the one thing that they're trying to 
uh, they're trying to investigate and they need to in some way or other focus on that. So, so when we're investigating ourselves, we are trying to isolate ourselves. We're trying to isolate the awareness that we actually are from all the things of which we are aware. We, we isolate it. We, we, in science, they, they, can, they may have ways of separating all the compounds in a plant or something. Uh, they will have instruments for that and techniques for that. When it's a matter of investigating ourselves, no instruments can help us. The only instrument we have is our attention. It's our attention that has given rise to all this. Because we allow our attention to go out, we see all this. So it, attention is, is, is the key. So it's by turning our attention away from any object, away from any phenomena, back towards that which is aware of these objects, that which is aware of these phenomena. It's a very, very subtle process. But people say, oh, it's too, too I, I can't find this eye. It's, it's not something that we have to find. We are that. We have to, we just, if, we're all aware of ourselves. The problem is, we are not attentively aware of ourselves. Because we are so interested in other things, we, we get so much pleasure from things in the world. We get pleasure from reading books, watching films, eating food, um, getting a pay rise, whatever. We, 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 find, we, we seem to derive pleasure from so many things outside <coughs> us. Because we have desire for these things, when we experience them, we experience the happiness. Bowen said the happiness is actually within you. But it seems to us that the happiness is coming from external things. So we have so much desire to be aware of external things because we seem to get happiness from them. So because we are attending to things other than ourselves, though we are always self-aware, we are negligently self-aware. All Atma Vichara, self-investigation or self-inquiry is, is trying to be attentively self-aware. Trying to be uh, to attend to this self-awareness which is always there. Self-awareness is like the screen on which the picture is, in, in a cinema, uh, the picture is projected on a screen. The screen remains unchanged, pictures are changing. Self-awareness is the background on which all uh, awareness of phenomena uh, uh, appears on the background of self-awareness. So we have to try and isolate that self-awareness from all these other things. That's why it's called turning. We're not literally turning, but metaphorically we're turning. We're turning 100, we're trying to turn 180 degrees away from all phenomena back to the awareness that is aware, uh, aware of all these phenomena. So it, it's trying to make that 180 degree turn. Because of our attachment to the phenomena, at first we may be able to turn only 10, 20, 30 degrees. <coughs> but by trying, 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 by persistently, that's what Bhagavan said, tirum bihahandane, dinam ahakankan. Dinam literally means daily. But again, it's used metaphorically. That means constantly, persistently trying to turn within, to see yourself with the inner eye. What is the inner eye? It's awareness, it's, it's attention. So it's using our power of attention to turn it back towards ourselves, the one who is attending, to see what we actually are. So would you say that it's, um, you could describe it as um, being aware of being aware? Well, we could, but that, that could, there's a potentially, um, when we talk about awareness and being aware, because we are aware of... Um, are you aware that um, Moscow is the capital of Russia? No. You're not aware that Moscow is the capital of Russia? No. Okay, well, now I tell you, Moscow is the capital of Russia, so now you're aware of the fact. <laughs> so we, we, use aware, we use the word aware just to mean that we have knowledge of something. So the, the word awareness, so, or are, are you aware um, that I'm sitting here? You can see me, can't you? Yes. Right, so you're aware of me sitting here. So you're being aware of me sitting here. So uh, being aware of being aware, being aware of what? Then we, we, we can easily leak, uh, come to confusion. 
get ourselves into confusion when we talk in these terms. That's why, that's why Bowen always stressed I or oneself. It's yourself you have to be aware of. Who is aware of all these things? We talk of um, uh, my awareness of this. Awareness can mean a knowledge of something, but we also use aware awareness in the sense of that which is aware. It's in that sense we need to be aware, not of being aware, we need to be aware of that which is aware. What is aware? You are aware. So you need to be aware of yourself. It's not, you're, not, you're not being aware of the process of being aware, you're being aware of what is aware. Do you understand? Uh, listening to you now. Yes. Um, there is aware, an awareness yes. of being aware of, of me. You, yes, yes. But, but what is it that is aware of that? It's turning back to the subject, the one who is aware. Because you know, in objective awareness, you have a subject. You have, a, you have an object, and you have a process of the subject being aware of the object. But we are trying to isolate the subject. We're trying to isolate that which is aware. We're trying to go beyond that process of objective knowing, back to the subjective knowing. Whereas knowing anything other than yourself is, an act, is, an, is a mental activity. To, to know anything, to perceive anything, to cognize anything other than ourself, our attention, so to speak, has to go away from ourselves towards something else. That is a movement, that is an activity. When we turn our attention back towards ourselves, that activity is subsiding. That is why self-attentiveness is also called summa irupadu, just being. Because there's no activity involved in being self-attentive. It's a state of being. To be aware, to be at, to attend to anything else is an action. To attend to ourself is our natural state of being because our being is self-awareness, and self-awareness is our being. Self-awareness is what we actually are. So can, can this happen at any time? It can happen at any time, even now. Yeah, even now, any one of us can turn back within and see ourselves as we actually are. Why we don't do so? Because we still have this desire and attachment for other things. We are not yet ready to let go of everything else. That is why who, wait, people say, oh, it's very difficult when I try to turn within, my mind keeps on coming outwards. Who is, who is creating that resistance? We ourselves are resisting. Nobody is preventing us from attending to ourselves. When we try to turn our attention within, we don't want to let go. Because we don't want to die, and now we as this ego don't want to die. So I have yes. to return to the question, who am I? Persistent. Yes, yes. It, but it's not, even, it, 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 it's not even the question, who am I? We have to investigate, who am I? Yes. That we have to, uh, we have to, what is the question, who am I pointing towards? It's pointing towards I. That is what, yes, that is what we have to return to. We have to investigate what am I, so who am I. So inquiry to self-realization, because paying attention to the self leads to silence. Silence being no thought, without thought. Being in a position where there are no thoughts at all. Silence, still, with stillness. From stillness, how do we go to drop into the self or What do you mean by what, what do you mean by stillness or silence? Do you mean absolute silence or relative silence? Absol in absolute silence, there's no ego. So that is self-realization. That itself is self-realization. If there's no ego there. But if you, if you come out of that state, then the ego was still there. If you come out and say, I experience silence, that I would experience silence is the ego. So that is not absolute silence. So how does one make it permanent? By persevering in attending to yourself. The more we attend to ourselves, the more the mind subsides, and the more the mind subsides, the more uh, we ex uh, more deeply we experience silence. When the when we when the mind or ego has subsided completely, in the perfect absolute clarity of self-awareness, 
then that is eternal silence. There's no coming out of that. That's manonasa. There is no process, actually. It is, or if there is a process, the only process is focusing our attention more and more keenly on ourselves. Or as Sadhuam used to say, during practice we are turning 10, 20, 30, 90, 120 degrees. Self, what is called self-realization, that is the, the, the annihilation of ego, is when we turn 180 degrees. That is when our attention is completely withdrawn from even the subtlest of objects and we are aware only of ourself, attentively aware of ourself, that is when we, the point at which the ego is found to not exist at all. That is what is, that is Atmanyana. But that comes and goes, isn't it? Uh, it Abhinyana cannot come and go. Abhinyana is eternal. It's the e it's so long as the ego is coming and going, it hasn't yet merged in Abhinyana. What it is merging, if it emerges at all, it's only in sleep, which is layer. Even if, you, even if it experiences what is called Nivikalpa Samadhi, that is just another type of sleep, it's a mana layer. We, uh, the only, uh, the, what we are seeking is not manole, but, but it's important to understand the difference between the ego subsiding in sleep and the ego subsiding in manonasa. When the ego subsides in sleep or any state of manole, it what causes it to subside is some other factor. For example, in normal sleep, we, we, we've been active for 16 hours, our, our ego has run out of energy, it no longer has energy to project the world. So it needs a period of rest, it subsides back into sleep due to sheer, sheer exhaustion. So in sleep what we experience is pure self-awareness, but in sleep we experience the pure self-awareness as a result of the subsidence of the ego. Because when the ego is not there, what remains is only pure self-awareness. When no picture is projected on the screen, what remains is the screen alone. So self-awareness is like the screen, it's the background on which waking and dream appear. And when it, nothing appears, that is the plain white screen. Uh, that is pure self-awareness. But in sleep, we subside because of exhaustion. If we, say, have have done do an operation, we're given general anesthesia. We, the, the cause of our, our ego subsiding is the general anesthesia. If you're practicing pranayama and you go into nirvikalpa samadhi, it is because of that um, forcible uh, control of the breath that the ego subsides. These are all external causes. And because the ego hasn't subsided because of self-awareness, the, self the pure self-awareness is experienced as a result of the subsidence of the ego. In Manonasa, the ego subsides as a result of the pure self-awareness. That is, in, in, there's a Tamil text called Kaivalya Navanitam, and there it is said, jnana is not inimicable to agnana. Because jnana means self-awareness. We are always self-aware. So merely being self-aware is not sufficient to destroy the ego. But the ego is actually, the ego couldn't rise without, I mean, self-awareness is the screen. So it's, it's, the, it's the basis of the ego. The ego is, is, a, is a mixed form of self-awareness. An awareness of ourselves as something other than what we are. So, whereas pure self-awareness is, is the awareness I am, the awareness I am this body, I am Guru Das, that is ego. Uh, so, it, it, as I said, in Kavarnalena Viditam, it is said, Jnana is not inimical to Ajnana, uh, because Jnana is the basis of Ajnana. Without Jnana, there couldn't be Ajnana. It's, it's, it's like the screen, where Ajnana is like the picture on the screen. Um, uh, so, the, um, what is required, it is said there, is vritti jnana. 
What vritti jnana means is, jnana means self-awareness, vritti jnana means attentive self-awareness. We're always self-aware, but we're generally, as I was saying earlier, we're negligently self-aware, because we're more interested in other things, our attention is directed out towards other things, so those self-awareness is there in the background, it's not the focus of our, uh, our attention, it's not focused on that. So when, if we're active throughout the day, we become tired, and so the ego subsides, what remains is pure self-awareness. No picture is being projected on the screen. As soon as we, the ego rises again, picture is projected on the screen. What we, what, vritti jnana means attentive self-awareness. If we attend to ourselves keenly, if we attend to ourselves keenly enough, the ego will subside, but the ego is a wrong knowledge of ourself, a wrong awareness of ourself. We mistake ourselves to be something other than ourself. I am now aware of myself as Michael, as this body. So that is self-awareness, but it's self-awareness mixed up with this awareness of this body. Um, if I focus my attention on the self-awareness alone, isolating the self-awareness from the Michael by trying to attend only to myself, the, the, the more keenly we focus our attention on ourselves, that is, the more our attention is drawn from, withdrawn from other things, and the more in, uh, clearly we are, or intensely we are attentively self-aware, the more the ego will subside. Eventually, when our attention is turned the full 180 degrees, when we're aware only of ourselves, attentively aware only of ourselves, that is the point at which the ego is destroyed. That attentive self-awareness, vrittinyana, is what destroys the ego. So, but as I say, in sleep, we experience the pure self-awareness as a result of the subsidence of the ego. In, in, uh, in jnana, atmanyana, we we, the ego is destroyed as a, or has com subsided completely and hence permanently as a result of the, uh, being attentively self-aware. So that's all, the, the whole practice from beginning to end is just trying to be more and more keenly, attentively self-aware. That's all there is to it. It's so, so simple. It is, seems to us to be difficult because we're not yet ready to let go of this ego. We still have, we have more love for other things than we have for ourselves. That is for ourselves as we actually are. We always have love for ourselves. But now, uh, love for ourselves, because we mistake this body to be ourselves, we love this body, we, we have more love for this body, for what we seem to be. To the extent that the ego subsides, to that extent do we experience silence. But the silence Bhagavan talks about is not just relative quietness of mind. Silence Bhagavan talks about it, absolute silence. That absolute silence is the state in which the ego doesn't rise. Because the, right, the ego is the first noise. The ego rises and projects everything else. So all, all other things are noise, but the root of all noise, using the term noise figuratively speaking, is the ego. So the absolute silence is experienced only when the ego subsides. In sleep we experience absolute silence, but as I say, because we subside in sleep because of exhaustion, that doesn't destroy the ego. In order to destroy the ego, while the ego is still active, it, 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 of its own volition, it has to turn its attention back towards itself and uh, to be attentively self-aware, to see itself as it actually is. Because the ego is a wrong knowledge, a, a mistaken awareness of ourself, it is destroyed only by correct awareness of ourself. Nirvikalpa Samadhi is one type of Manolaya. But one has said there are two types of subsidence of mind. In verse 13 of Upadeshundi he says, there's Nasa and Laya. Any temporary state of subsidence of mind is Laya. So whether it is sleep or whether it is 
coma or anesthesia or nivicalpus samadhi, whatever it is, it's all only manalaya. And from, uh, when it, the mind subsides in manalaya, it will rise again, in, in, inevitably. Death is also a type of manalaya. Temporally the mind subsides, and then it begins to dream another dream. So the, uh, only when the mind is destroyed will it not, never rise again. And it is destroyed only when it turns back and looks at itself to see what it actually is. Why is it destroyed? Because once, we, when, when, how do we kill the snake? We look at it carefully, we see it's a rope. Once we've seen it as a rope, we can then imagine, oh yes, I was mistaking that to be the head and this to be the tail. But we, the fear that we felt earlier, we can never feel that fear again because we know it is only a rope. So once we know what we actually are, once we actually uh, perceive what, uh, become aware of ourselves as we actually are, we can never again mistake ourselves to be the ego. But actually, when we, when, when we become aware of ourselves as we actually are, but we who are then aware of ourselves as we actually are is ourselves as we actually are, which is always aware of ourselves as we actually are. The ego seems to exist in whose view? Only in the view of the ego. That is why it's Maya. It's completely non-existent. It, it's a non-existent thing that seems to exist only in its own view. So how, how totally non-existent is that? How can a non-existent thing be a, uh, uh, seem to exist in its own view. We can't understand it, but if we actually see ourselves as we actually are, it, it's not just that there was once an ego and it's now been destroyed. The, the experience when the ego is actually destroyed is there never was an ego at all. That is a jata. There was no creation, no sustenance, no destruction, nothing. What is, is as it is always. Well, Michael, the, the destruction of the ego is an instant process once, once you see it. Either you see it as a snake or a rope. So once, once you see it, it's that. Yes. It's, it's instantaneous, instantaneous, yes. Just like that. Just like that, yes. Never to come back again. Never to come back again. Right. So long as you think it's a snake, so long as you see it as a snake, you, uh, it seems to exist. Once you see clearly that it's a rope, you can never again see it as a snake. Oh, when I say see it as, you can, you can imagine, oh yes, it, that, it, yeah, that's why I saw it as a snake. But you, you cannot actually mistake it. You, you can never feel fear again. Once you've seen very clearly that it's a rope, the fear never comes again. In the same way, when we see our, what we actually are, we can never again mistake ourselves to be what we are not. And that's what the ego is. The ego is nothing but a mistaken awareness of ourself. So it's, it's not a process, it's an instant. It's an instant, yes. The preparation, the getting ourselves, that it, uh, sharpening our power of attention, cultivating that love to be aware of ourselves, that is a process. But the actual final moment, Sadhuam gives an analogy. In the old days when they had cannons, you had to put in the gunpowder and you, you had to put in, ram in something else and then you had to put the cannonball. All that took time. Once you light it, the cannon blasts. It happens in a moment. So all our sadhana is just preparing the cannon. But the actual uh, uh, destruction of the ego or dawn of jnana is a split second. Boom, yes, exactly. <laughs> Bhagavan also used the analogy of atom bomb. Uh, in day by day, there's a, he says in one place, when the atom bomb of jnana falls and destroys the ego, all these worlds will be destroyed in an instant. Like putting a spark to a a, a mountain of cotton. It gets destroyed instantly. Bhagavan said that just a few weeks or months after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki.
Um, <coughs> Father Bob also said somewhere um, that seeing is being. Yes, yes. That, that is, um, seeing all this is not being, seeing yourself is being. He say, in Upadesha Undia, he says, Tanai iritale, tanai aridalam. That is, being as oneself is alone knowing oneself. Because being and awareness are not two different things. That which is, is what is aware. And that which is being. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so that can only happen in once the ego is extinguished. Yeah. Well, in that connection, <coughs> I think it's in verses 20 and 21 of the 40 verses. Um, Bhagavan said that. Um, the, the only way to see God is to be God. I think that's what he said. He, he says in, in one of the, I think in verse 20, I think it is, Unadal uh, Khan, that is, becoming food is seeing. Yes. So yes. only when we are swallowed by God, we see God. That, that's right. You can only see God by being a prey to him. Yes, yes. Yes. Whereas in the New Testament, it, um, in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, um, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Yes. And Bhagavan said, you can't see God. Yes. You, you can only, you can only mm, be God. Right? Yes. Well, if you uh, pure in heart means being without ego. If you're without ego, you're seeing God, because you're being God. Yes, being God. Yes, yes. So Bhagavan is not contradicting what Jesus said. He's just, uh, he's just, just saying it a bit more clearly. Yes, yes, yes. That which... <coughs> That's why Bhagavan used to say, jnana alone is the jnani. People, people have a, people, generally when people read about self-realization, they think, oh, one day, if I do this uh, sadhana for long enough, one day I'm going to be self-realized. As if I, Michael, will, Michael will never be self-realized, Alistair will never be self-realized. Because the, it's not the person who is self-realized, who is it who now says, I am Alistair, or I am Michael? It's the ego. When the ego is obliterated, that is what is called self-realization. So to say a self-realized person is, is a contradiction in terms. Because so long as we are a person, we don't know what, we, we are not aware of ourselves as we actually are. We are not self-realized. When we are self-realized, we are no longer a person. That's why Bhagavan said, jnana means pure self-awareness. That self-awareness is alone what is aware of itself. So we will never self attain self-realization. We will die and what will remain is then self-realization, Atmanyana. We might as well give up then. Yes. In, in one of Sadhuam's verses, he's written a um, hundred verses called Arunachala Bemba in Tamil verses. One of them he translated into English, which is something to the effect, if I remember correctly, a naked lie then it would be if any man were to say that he realized the self diving within through proper inquiry set in, not for knowing but for death, this good for nothing's ego's worth, tis our natural of the self alone by which the self is known. Nice. <laughs> So if we have ambition to be self-realized, we're going to be sorely disappointed because we'll no longer be there to, to enjoy it. <laughs> what is, but what remains, what, what remains when the ego is destroyed, which is what we actually are, that is always aware of itself. So self, that's why Bhagavan said, if jnana is something to be attained, it would be lost. Jnana is always present. So jnana is not gaining anything, it's just losing everything. Getting rid of the ego is jnana. It's not an attainment, it's a loss. Yeah. Okay. Is it fair to say that the ego is just identification with the body and the mind? 
Yep, yeah, but one used to say. But, 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 but the self-awareness, I am this body, that is the ego. But it's not always the same body, because now I'm aware of myself as this body. In dream, the same ego is aware of itself as some other body. And when this body dies, if, it, if his ego doesn't dis isn't destroyed before that, it will again dream some other dream, another life will come. I'll, instead of mistaking myself to be Michael, I'll take myself to be Mary or Jane or John or whoever. Yes, in my dreams I seem to be, um, it doesn't seem to be very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Which of your dreams? Is it, how's your present dream? Is it? Well, that seems much more acceptable. <laughs> but, but, but now you're making that judgment from this waking state. Oh, yes. But in dream, if you were having the same conversation, when we are dreaming, we think we're awake. Yes. Yes, I probably do. But when I remember it, when, when mm. I get, become awake and remember the, the dream, yes. it's singularly not pleasant. Yes, yes. Well, when you, wake up from this, when you wake up from this dream by knowing yourself as you actually are, you'll find this was a singularly unpleasant dream. <laughs> well, yes, I so. <laughs> but at the moment, it seems to be relatively pleasant. It's tolerable. Tolerable, yeah. tolerable. And therefore, I'm kind of reluctant to let go. Yes, 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 yes. But it seems tolerable because, because you, you seem to be Barry, and you're so familiar with being Barry, yeah. you're, you're, you're quite comfortable being Barry. You're comfortable in your own skin, as they say. Yeah. I'm but but in, on occasions, I feel yeah, well, we all do, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture, it's a mixture. An anxiety attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But one thing, even though it may be okay, this state we're in, we are never satisfied, are we? We always have desire. That is what it meant by dukkha. Buddha said, uh, uh, embodied life is dukkha. Dukkha means... Uh, it's usually translated as suffering, but more correctly it means it's a state of discomfort. Mm. We're ill at ease. We, we, we're never completely relaxed. We always, some, some desire or, some, or fear or something is always niggling us. We can never, so long as we exist as this ego, we can never be satisfied. Mm. And Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, that is proof that you are Brahman. Because if, 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 why we, are, we cannot be satisfied, whatever we achieve, if, even if we have all the wealth in the world, all the pleasures in the world, we will never be satisfied because we cannot be satisfied with anything less than what we actually are. Because we are the infinite whole, whatever else we achieve is only finite. It can never satisfy, we can never be satisfied with what is finite. Us, even the satisfaction we feel is only finite satisfaction, which itself is a type of dissatisfaction. Yeah. But, uh, yes, it almost seems to be, well, I know I shouldn't say it, but it almost seems to be uh, pretty difficult, doesn't it? <laughs> It's pretty difficult, but so long as you're not, as we, because we're not ready to let go. Yeah. Yes, it's relatively enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. Suppose, supposing you're on the top of a small, a tall, uh, uh, high cliff, and there's a nice railing there. You can hold that railing and you can look over. It's pretty enjoyable because you get a nice view down there. And you also get a bit of a thrill because you, you know you're in danger. So, but you, so long as you're holding on to the railing, you're fine. Yeah. If you're asked to let go of the railing, that you're going to find pretty difficult, aren't you? Oh, almost impossible. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, that is the situation. There are a few crazy people that, you know, they've got these special suits. They go up on top of a... They do bungee jumping or something. Oh, they, oh yeah, they're gliding. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
but they're still safe because they got that. Well, they, yes, they're only relatively safe because a lot of them kill themselves. They do, they do, but uh, it's very but they get a thrill from it. They get a big thrill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I that you that you always find that. My only ego is while while one being out pain, your ego is not that. It's not? Yeah, you are just a... How can... Bhagavan says, if, if the ego is not there, nothing is there. Ahande yundayin anetam undahum. Ahande yundrail indru anetam. So long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, who is the one who is aware? It's the ego. But the fact that people take such risks for a thrill shows how desperate we are for happiness. We're even ready to risk our own life for a little iota of happiness. Yes, and also uh, with taking the drugs, for example. Yeah. They're very risky. Yeah, yeah. And of course, people, quite a few people, young people, kill themselves yeah. taking ecstasy and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Looking for something. Yeah. Yes. Bhagavan said, Guru is necessary. But the real Guru is within you as I. God, Guru, Bhagavan often used to say, God, Guru and Self are one and the same. So, so it's we, now, we, we, when we, when we, when we turn, turn back within to see ourself, what is it that guides us? We are guided by if you want to see the sun, what guides you to see the sun? The light coming from the sun guides you. You can see here it's not so bright, here it's bright, there's the sun. So we are guided by what we're looking for. So we are guided by ourselves. Why a guru, external guru is necessary? Because our mind is going outwards, the, na the natural um, the natural flow of the mind is outwards. We need a guru to come and tell us, no, what you're looking for is within, turn within. So Bhagavan in this, appeared in this external human form to give us his teachings to tell us to turn within. That is the function of the outward guru. But people make a big thing of this. They say, oh, in, you need to be in the present. I mean, they're, they're even people who are claiming to be disciples of Bhagavan, who teach up, who say to others that you must be in the presence of a guru in order to get self-realization. This is a complete myth. Bhagavan never said, the, Bhagavan said guru is not the body. The body you see is not the guru. The guru is what is within you. What is within you, your, your own self, appears outwardly in the form of a guru to tell you to turn within. But it's not the physical presence of the Guru, but it's the inner presence of the Guru. And to see, the, to, to be aware of that inner presence, we have to look within. So it's got nothing to... It's, um, Bhagavan said Guru is necessary, but, but he also said Guru is not physical. Guru is your own self. So, but people misinterpret this, because there are people who want to be Guru, they want to be like Bhagavan, they want to have disciples. So they say, if I want, to, if I want you to be a disciple of mine, I'll say, I'm self-realized, you need a self-realized person, so you have to come to me. That's basically what, the, the, there's so many people who are basically saying that. They don't say it so explicitly, but it's what it means. But actually, um, there are people who have been teaching Bhagavan I suspect um, the level of guru haven't realized what the, they were self-realized. Is that not true? You, yes. um, you, you cannot be... The famous um, Russian monk, for example, mm -hmm. what was the name? Rasputin. Rasputin. Mm -hmm. 
self-realization. Okay. You are self-realized, but you realize it. You are self-realized, but don't realize it. <laughs> According to Bhagavan. So in that sense, but but yeah, we're all self -realized. But you cannot be, you you. you uh, <laughs> so long as we are aware of anything other than ourselves, we are ego. When the ego is destroyed, what remains is what is always self-realized, which is what we really are. And what we really are is always aware of itself as it really is. So it cannot be aware of itself as it really is without being aware of itself as it really is. It's impossible. It's a contradiction in terms. Can you be aware without being aware that you're aware? I think my brain hurts. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're aware of the brain hurting. <laughs> so you're aware of something. And you're aware of being aware of the brain is hurting. So we cannot be aware without being aware. We cannot be aware of ourselves as we actually are without being aware of ourselves, without being aware of being aware of ourselves as we actually are. So, but people say, people say so many things. How can we say any person is self-realized? How can we know? When, when, when people used to ask Bhagavan, is so-and-so self-realized? Bhagavan said, there is only one jnani, and you are that. But people have so many beliefs. Bhagavan has given very, very simple teachings, but people, people have built up their own imagination about it. There were people, pe Bhagavan's presence was very, very powerful, it is said. People who sat in Bhagavan's presence, um, uh, often they, they would come with all sorts of um, problems in their life, they, they may be, suffer bereavement or something, they come and sit in Bhagavan's presence, they feel peace. Their minds are much agitated by things, they feel relative calm. But that is not self-realization. That is because of, uh, because Bhagavan is what he is, his presence is very calming, very... But in order to experience ourselves as we actually are, it's not merely by sitting in Bhagavan's presence. Bhagavan, what we should have to follow what Bhagavan taught us. Bhagavan said, you cannot know what you actually are unless you, see your, unless you look within and see yourself as you actually are. So we have to turn within. When we turn within, what does it matter whether we're in the present? I mean, we're not even aware of Bhagavan's presence then. People say, from Bhagavan, there was some, some spiritual power radiating. That's all in their imagination. The spiritual, Bhagavan is present in us, so the spiritual power is already there. There's nothing but... The purpose of the outward form of a guru is to give us teachings in words, to say, turn within. That is the purpose of the outward guru. And Bhagavan said, the outward guru, the outward form of a guru, is like the lion that appears in the elephant's dream. When, when an elephant, elephants are so afraid of lions, if they dream about a lion, the fear of a lion will wake them up, so it is said. That's a traditional belief. So referring to that, Bhagavan said, just like the, the lion that the elephant sees in its dream is not real, it's the elephant's own mental projection, but what results from seeing that lion is the awakening of the elephant, that is real, so also, the unreal form of the Guru brings about the real awakening. How the Guru does that? By turning us within. So we're not going to get rid... By going and sitting in Bhagavan's presence, we won't get self-realization. We will get self-realization by turning within to see that Bhagavan is always present within us as ourself. That is the only way. So there's no shortcut. Because one reason why there's no shortcut is the shortest, what is the, what can be nearer to us than ourself? So how can we take a shortcut back to ourself? <laughs> we just have to look at ourselves, be aware of ourselves as we actually are. No shortcut is possible. And no alternative route is possible.
If you want to see the sun, you have to look at it. Simple as that. But there were people, weren't there, uh, um, who did seem to just get something from Bhagavan and claim to be... Yes, because they followed what Bhagavan told them. Because they followed what Bhagavan told them. There was, a, um, there was one disciple of Bhagavan called Tine Swami. He was called Tine Swami. Tine means in front of a house they, there are benches. Uh, they, often they have a veranda with a bench. That bench is called a Tine. He was called Tine Swami because he spent the last so many years of his life just living on the Tine in a in the house of a family. But when he came to Bhagavan, he, um, I don't have to tell the whole story, but basically he was with Bhagavan for some time and he, there was a prospect of his getting a job in, uh, he was a bi biochemist, there was a prospect of his getting a job in a medical college in uh, Pondicherry. Uh, so he was going there to apply for the job. So after having spent some weeks in Bhagavan present, he took permission to leave. And usually if someone sit, tells Bhagavan they're going, Bhagavan will say, no, just nod or just say yes. But in that case, in when Tineswami said it, Bhagavan said to him, Iru. Iru simply means be. But it's also, if you, if, um, if, um, so, uh, suppo supposing we, we, you and I, after this talk, we're going to go to the, catch the tube together. And you've still got something to do to, uh, here. You say to me, wait. In Tamil, the word you would use is, is iru, be. So also, in normal usage, it means wait. So everyone sitting there, I mean, if anyone else noticed what, what was said, when Tenethami said to Bhagavan, Bhagavan, I'm going, uh, I'm going to take his leave to go to Pondicherry, and Bhagavan said iru, they would have thought, okay, Bhagavan's just telling him to wait. The only person there who understood what happened was Murugana, and Murugana told this to Saduam. When Bhagavan said that one word to Tene Swami, Iru, because Tene Swami was already obviously a very, very ripe soul, and he was already, having read Bhagavan's teachings, he was already practicing it very deeply. When Bhagavan said that one word, Iru, that was enough to annihilate his ego then and there. And after that, his behavior became strange. He was just going around begging his food, his hair grew, he was living in rags, his family came to ask him to come back. But his, his life as a family person, that was over. Bhagavan had swallowed the ego, and from then on he just lived as a sadhu. He hardly talked, to, uh, sometimes he would be talking, you cannot tell what language he's talking in. It would be a mixture of Tamil, Tamil, Telugu, French, because he knew a number of languages. French, English he'll be talking, or some words you can't even decipher. I mean, I knew him quite well. But um, very, very occasionally he would say something that would be, um, would be meaningful. For instance, once I was, um, I was filming him, because a, a friend had come from America and he had a movie camera, so I was filming him, and another old sadhu, a very old devotee of Bhagavan, was there, and he went and, uh, to, um, to Tine Swami, who was sitting on a bench just outside the house where he, in front of a veranda where he usually lived, and um, he introduced himself and said, Swami, I'm Shankarananda from Daisor. And Tine Swami said, yes, I know. And then Tine Swami um, uh, uh, put, pointed his hand like that at me and said, what to do, Michael is always doing like this. Because I was filming him at that time. So sometimes he would say something intelligible. He knew what was going on around, but most of the time, I mean, people would go, sometimes go and ask him for Upadesha or something. He, he wouldn't say anything. Sometimes he'd say to him, go to Bhajana Swami. He talks. Bhajana Swami is what, the name for how he referred to Sadhu Om. Mm -hmm. Because Sadhu Om used to, uh, was, used to sing bhajan, so... So you look, basically, you're saying he looked crazy. He looked crazy, yes, by, by normal standards. Yeah. 
but it was. Yeah. yeah, but that was that one word Bhagavan said to him, Ilu. So sometimes the, one word from Bhagavan is sufficient. But why is it sufficient? Because that was the last push. He was already trying to turn within. That one word was the last push within. And we can't say there may have been people who who did experience that in Bhagavan, who did, uh, whose egos was, were annihilated in Bhagavan's physical presence. But it's not because of Bhagavan's physical presence, it's because they turned their attention within. Bhagavan's physical presence may have had a, a driving effect, but so many, there were people who lived 40, 50 years with Bhagavan, and they still had big egos. Bhagavan said in, in, in there's a verse in Guru Vachikawai, in which Muruna records what Bhagavan said, just like the shadow of the foot of a lamp never moves away, there are people who spend their whole life at the feet of a jnana guru, but the darkness of their ignorance never uh, diminishes. That doesn't mean that living in Bhagavan's presence is useless. That it, those people would have been benefited, but the benefit wasn't obvious to outside. I, mean, I know, I've known people who were with Bhagavan who even so many years after Bhagavan had left the body, they still have very, very big egos. But it's not that being with Bhagavan is useless, it would have had an effect, but um, because of their immaturity, that effect will take time for that to, to uh, fructify. So I'm not, I'm not saying that being in Bhagavan's presence is not useful, but we shouldn't think that self, we'll get self-realization just by being in Bhagavan's presence. You know, Bhagavan says in Nanya, when he says, it gives that analogy of like the prey in the jaws of a tiger um, uh, will, uh, can never uh, escape, so those who have come under the glance of the Guru's grace will, never, uh, will, will surely be saved and will never be forsaken. After saying that, he says in the next sentence, Eninum Guru Katya Varipadi Tabarada Navatika Vendam. I mean, uh, however, uh, it is necessary to follow unfailingly the path shown by the Guru. The path shown by the Guru is to turn our mind within. So unless we do that, we, even Bhagavan cannot save us. Bhagavan will not save us until we turn our attention within, because uh, turning our attention within is, unless we are willing to turn our attention within, Bhagavan isn't going to force jnana upon us. We have to be willing to accept it. It is said, I don't know if it's true, um, but um, I think Poon, uh, Papaji, Punja, um, he, he apparently said that when he came to Bhagavan, he asked him, uh, can you give me what you've got? And according to the words he said, but I think maybe Bhagavan didn't quite say it in these terms, yes, I can give it, but can you receive it? And his reaction was, oh, he's so arrogant that he says that. Bhagavan would probably, have, he wouldn't have said, yes, I can give it. He would have said, yes, it can be given, but can you receive it? So we have to be ready to receive it. In order to receive it, what do we have to do? Very simple, we have to turn within. And from what you were saying before, it's not for a long period, but you have whatever it is, just turning within actually is. Well, it, it, turning within is turning our attention back towards ourselves, being self-attentive. It, 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 it's a process. I mean, it's a process in the sense that we have to cultivate that love. And we cultivate the love by constant practice. And as we practice more and more, our attention gets more and more refined and we're able to uh, turn deeper and deeper within. So that is a process. The preparation is a process. but. The actual, um, the actual annihilation of the ego happens in an instance. When you're turning back within like that, um, some people talk of this uh, dark night of the soul and all that sort of thing. Yes. Do you think that's... Uh... Dark night of the soul, that's a phenomenon, isn't it? Any phenomenon is something other than ourselves. 
So our attention hasn't yet turned completely within. Yes, it is true. When we're on this journey, we, Bhagavan used to say, when people say, oh Bhagavan, I, I'm trying to meditate, but so many thoughts come. Bhagavan said, yes, all that's inside has to come out. Because if it doesn't come out, you cannot uh, get rid of it. When thoughts arise, every time a thought arises, every time we become aware of anything other than ourselves, we have a choice. Either to follow it, or to turn our attention back within. So, everything that's inside does have to come out. We either, uh, so in every thought that comes out, uh, we have a choice. Either to turn back within, or to follow it. So, every time we exercise our choice to turn back within, sorry, can we just wait a minute? <laughs> yeah, uh, Every time we exercise our choice to turn back within, we are strengthening our love to be self-attentive. Every time uh, we, we fail to do so, we are missing an opportunity. We're not going backwards, but we're missing one, one more opportunity to step forward, as it were. So, um, we, we have to be constantly try, trying to practice this more and more and more. By doing so, we refine our power of attention and we increase our love. And that love and the love and the sharpness of attention actually are not are inseparable. The more we cultivate that love, the more we'll be willing to let go of things. And, what is, and we have to let go in order to surrender. What is surrender? Bhagavan has said very, very beautifully in Nanya. Anma chintane tabira, vera chintane kalambaduttaku, satram idum kodamo, apma nishta paranai irupade, tanai isanaku alipadam. That means being apma uh, paran means one who is established as himself, as oneself. So being as one who is established as oneself giving no room, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any thought other than Atmachintana. Atmachintana means, literally means thought of oneself, but it means self-attentiveness. That is giving oneself to God. So it's only by being self-attentive that we can surrender ourselves completely. It's only by being self-attentive that we can let go of this ego. So we just have to practice and practice and practice and practice and practice until sooner or later we'll succeed. That's a good, good note to finish on. <laughs>